Hey guys, it's Gordon, fascinated by fungi. Today I have the honor of being joined by Jess Starwood, who is an amazing chef, forager, uh, author, all-round herbalist, and incredible human being who I've had the uh, extreme privilege of getting to meet uh, in my time in joining the mushroom community. And Jess has been very, very generous with, uh, with her time in, in helping me find certain types of mushrooms. Last year, she was absolutely instrumental in helping me discover how to look for spring porcini and butter bolites and morels and all sorts of stuff. Uh, she regularly puts out some of the most amazing uh, vegan cooking content that I see anywhere on the internet. She takes absolutely beautiful photos, does really inspired dishes, and I constantly look to her as a source of inspiration um, for what to do with, with my fungal finds and how to process mushrooms. And she's definitely one of the people that I reach out to and, and love you know go for, going foraging with and stuff like that. So she's got a new book uh, that's going to be coming out soon, and we will talk about that and her experiences with writing it and maybe you know, the title of the book, you know, what it's about and, and go into her history too with herbalism and other things. So let me see if I can get her on the, uh, on the call here and we will get into it. Also, I know <laughs> the first thing I said, she's a chef and Jess and I both talked about it. Neither of us like to be referred to as, as chefs, but Hey, how you doing? Oh my gosh, your hair looks great. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I love the jars behind you. I had a feeling your aesthetic would, would fit perfectly. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just trying to convey to people the range of incredible stuff that you do uh, and trying to put a label on it's kind of hard because you're kind of a Jill of all trades and you've done a lot of things in your life. Um, what do you want to talk a little bit about just the jars behind you and like what, why they're there and what you do with stuff like that? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, like you said, I do um, so many different things. And um, these are all um, herbs that I have foraged um, over the last, well, I try to keep them pretty current, but everywhere I travel, <laughs> I am collecting uh, unique and interesting or, you know, medicinal herbs, or also um, dehydrating, um, you know, edible mushrooms that I'm keeping in stock around all year um, so I can have mushrooms, you know, any time of, of the year, whether it's, you know, not just fresh ones, but um, yeah, it's, I do so many things. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. Cause you, I mean, the other thing I think I would describe you as like most is probably an adventuring forager. Cause every time I check in on you, you are somewhere different. I mean, you're, you're based in LA and yet when I like hit you up, I'm like, you're in Washington, you're in Oregon, you're in Northern California, you're on the East coast. You're, you know, you've gone to a lot of places. And so it's really impressive that everywhere you go, you're constantly preserving little bits of that to kind of hang on to those experiences and be able to recapitulate them later. Um, Absolutely. But I also feel that because I eat a lot of the foods that I'm finding wherever I go is that, you know, you are what you eat. So I'm now like <laughs> part of all of these places that I go. And um, that was something I thought about the other day. And I was like, wow, well, no wonder now these new places that, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience there, but I've spent time there. And now I'm like, well, it feels like, oh, that's kind of home because I ate from that landscape, you know, it's part mm -hmm. of me now. I love, I love that concept. That's, and I mean, that's like, that's one of the things that you get out of traveling. It is you go somewhere, you try the local flavors, the culture, and you take a little bit of that home with you as sort of an internalized experience. But you're not just doing that with like, you know, going somewhere and having the tapas in Spain or something like that. You're going to the woods and you're finding the wild foods. You're finding the things that people might not even know grow in their own backyard. And so you're connecting not just with the place, but with the land, with the ecosystems on sort of a, a deeper right almost more primal level with the fact that you're like, you know, in there foraging for foods that people aren't necessarily aware of. Uh, how did you come to learn so much? Cause I'm still like, every time I look at what you're eating, I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I had no idea you could eat that. You know? um, well, I've been studying herbs and uh, wild foods for um, about 10 years now. Um, and, but even before that, like as a kid, I was just, fascinated by the plants that would well I grew up in Arizona in the desert and whenever it would rain there would all of a sudden be 
these plants that seemed to come out of nowhere. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And, um, uh, you know, I'd always had this interest in, um, wild foods is like, you know, if I were to run away, what, what could I eat? <laughs> what could I survive on? Um, you know, I was a big fan of that book, um, my side of the mountain where the boy runs away in the Catskill mountains and lives in a tree and eats all these wild foods and survives through the winter. And I was like, yep, that's going to be me. That is, that's the ultimate and, teenage fantasy, right? Just take into, <laughs> take off into the woods and be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Probably yeah. not totally true for a real teenager, especially not these days with our reliance on mm -hmm. social media and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, I like the thought. Right. So, I mean, you yeah. took that, some of those ideas and you turned it into a profession, right? I mean, cause in a way you're not just doing this as a hobby. This is like a way that you have supported yourself and really like forged a path. And I know you used to do herbalism and make more sort of tinctures and lotions and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you like made the transition from there being kind of an herbalist and being very plant focused to being like more of a forager and like food focused maybe? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of been a back and forth sort of journey. Um, I initially, when my first daughter was born, um, I had just kind of this epiphany that I had to focus on my health and mm -hmm. I started paying attention to what I ate and really kind of changed around, changed my diet around. Um, I addressed a whole bunch of health issues through my changing my diet. Um, and that was it was really fascinating. Um, and then I in herbs, because I kept, I want to kind of take it a step further. And herbs were really interesting to me. Um, and so I thought, well, I want to know everything about herbs. So I decided to get a master's degree. <laughs> and Good thing to do, I, right? <laughs> why not? <laughs> so I followed that path for quite a while. I started my apothecary and developed my own line of products. And I really enjoyed that. I love, um, I'm a very creative person. I love to create things. Um, and I got some such wonderful feedback from the community. They were like, especially my elderberry syrup. I harvested all of the elderberries myself. I, pro I everything was, you know, from me to them. And, and I loved that connection with people. Um, people would buy, you know, buy the, the quartz, buy the gallons of my elderberry syrup. And um, it just got so big. I mean, it was, it was getting big. It was getting popular. Um, I needed to hire people. I needed to expand. Um, but I, I just, I didn't, I was losing that connection with people that I couldn't, I just, didn't feel right outsourcing all of the production and mm -hmm. manufacturing to somebody else. Um, I would have to change from harvesting my own elderberries to buying them in bulk uh, to make it worthwhile. So I decided to let that go and move more into um, teaching and giving people that power to do it themselves. And that's what came to be really important to me. And then, of course, there's wild food. I love just playing with food and making it look good. And at all, I haven't uh, had any real formal training. I've worked in a few restaurants, but um, and I've worked with a lot of really uh, high profile chefs foraging for them. So I've learned a lot um, and then applying that to what I do. Um, I just, whatever's interesting to me, I follow that and <laughs> go that direction. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, well, so it's a good way like, of doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've dabbled in cooking too. And I realized the first thing we talked about, I was like, don't introduce me as a chef. And the first thing I called you as a chef, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, I feel similarly in that people would look at me and be like, Gordon, you cook all the time, you're a chef. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not like quite at that level of being a professional, but I love, I, same as you, I love to mess around with food. And I've had a lot of fun when we'd ha we've had a chance to cook together because it's like, you're the kind of person that you throw out an idea and it's like really easy to be like, oh, with this concept, what if we like wrapped it in this or added this thing? You're like, oh yeah, and then we can put this on top. And it just like, 
it's really fun to sit around and, and dream and think about food with people that have the capacity to kind of like work in that way. Um, and I can, I can totally, the more successful I become in this, the further I slide away from people and the personal experiences that drive the way that I get to like do this business. And I mean, you've seen that with like the greenwashing of mega brands like Tom's and, you know, Burt's Bees and stuff like that it used to be somebody mixing up a thing. And now it's like a commercially produced product that has like a fancy label, but you know, you don't want to make an elderberry syrup that becomes produced in China or something like that and lose the connection to the land and the people. So I definitely, yeah, definitely understand that. Is there, there's something too about elderberries can be kind of toxic, right? You want to be kind of careful when you, when you work with them. Um, they just need to be cooked and uh, heated okay. at some point at some capacity. And yeah, there's quite a misconception about them being toxic, but um, all you have to do is, is, uh, you know, cook heat them. them up, cook them. Uh, and that takes care of all of the, the cyanide type compounds that they have. That's good. I mean, and that's, that's a good point because like, there's a lot of mushrooms that would be toxic if you ate them raw. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are freaked out by mushrooms because they're like, oh, don't you know those are toxic? And I'm like, yeah, but as far as I know, there's really not a mushroom out there that can hurt you by touching it. Whereas there's a lot of plants that can hurt you by touching them. And there's a lot, but to me, there's a lot more toxic plants out there um, than mushrooms. And so that's part of why like stuff like herbalism, as much as I love herbs, which I'm culinary herbs, I'm very familiar with like the thought of foraging for certain plants, like kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies and the willies because I'm like, I just don't know enough and I could actually hurt myself. Like with mushrooms, I feel sort of safe that I can like touch and smell everything without really being worried about it. I'm just not going to eat anything that I don't know. Um, and so plants are like drastically more scary potentially depending on how things go. Um, you know, there's, there, yeah, you can have a, you know, like poison oak, it's the contact to dermatitis issues. Um, but um yeah you you don't want to go diving into something you you aren't too familiar with but uh yeah when i'm in a new environment i'm definitely like i'm reading everything i can i'm researching um very thoroughly there's a plant in colorado called um osha or bear root um it's in the parsley family and it looks very much like poison hemlock and mm. it's I mean, even it scares me sometimes, even every year I go back and I harvest it um, every summer and uh, it's like, okay, just make sure, double check. But, you know, I know it by smell. Um, it has a very distinctive smell and, um, you know, just the more you experience it, the more you um, get to know it, the better it, you know, develop your confidence over time. Good. I mean, I feel the same way every year with like Amanita Velosa, which is like, when I first started foraging, Jerry and I were like, we'll never eat Amanitas. And then over time, <laughs> I had to start dipping into the Amanita pool because I was finding these Velosas. But it's every year, it's a scary thing to be like, oh my God, am I going to eat something that could kill me? But the more you look at it, right. the more you sit around with it, get familiar with it, the more comfortable you get. And doesn't mean you should stop being careful. <laughs> doesn't mean you should right. get rid of that air of caution. But it just means that every time you see it, you're just that much faster to be like, yes, that is what I think it is. And I'm confident it is. I don't need to like sit around and second guess myself and send a hundred pictures. I'm just like, I know what it is. And there's a, there's just a certain level of like self-assuredness that comes with the experience of doing it time and time again. Uh, right. But like you said, when you go to new habitat, you can't go in there with that kind of confidence. You have to go in there, book in front of you and say, what is everything? Rely on local knowledge. Uh, and I think, yeah, being really respectful of like the environment and connected to the seasons and stuff like that, because there's a lot of places where like something might end up being a poisonous look like we like this occurs in a totally different season. So it's not right. something I have to worry about necessarily unless I'm just not thinking about where I'm at, and you know, what time it is kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. And going to places in different seasons, uh, you, it's a whole new um, experience and like the Pacific Northwest, I, I've always been there in the summertime. And this year, I finally got to be up there in the spring. And it was there was different things to try. And I'm like, Oh, wow, maybe now I need to add that to my calendar every year and to be there up for those certain plants or those certain mushrooms that are there at that time. So you, yeah, it's I mean, like getting a with, taste yeah. of 
sorry. Oh, no, I was Just gonna one say, last. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's getting that very specific taste of time and place, you know, season and where you can't get that. You can't buy that. You can't get that anywhere else. So That is the, the special element of like foraging terroir, right? Is encapsulating that exact moment where you were and time and season is that's it's so cool uh yeah. what i was going to ask you was so you travel a lot um like mm -hmm. i said la is home base but you end up you know all over the coasts and do you have sort of like yeah reg regular schedule where you're like okay i know that like maybe around this week in may i'm going to be up in this part of norcal and, and that kind of thing like how do you plan that um really just kind of following the seasons, especially mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Last year, I mm -hmm. followed the, the mushroom season all year, you know, wherever it was happening, that's where I was going um, from Pacific Northwest, Northern California in the winter, uh, and then, or sorry, Cal Northern California in the winter, somewhat, I mean, Southern California. Ugh, our season here is pretty bad. Um, um, um yeah wherever it was happening that's where i was going so yeah it was a particularly rough year here i mean napa i like i love that like watching your channel is a essentially a reflection of what i see in napa because although we're like fairly offset we have very similar biomes so it's like the the oak chaparral scrub that i have here is similar to what you have in la and in years past i've been able to say okay jess in like a month you're going to start seeing these mushrooms kind of thing but this year we just yeah. had no rain, period. So it was kind of a non-starter. So, yeah, I'm so glad that I was able to do my book last year because I needed photos of everything. And it was like, yeah, it would not have happened this year at all. No, no. So talk, tell me more about your book. I mean, you you have put it, you got in a proposal and this is kind of how this process works. You put in a proposal publishers review it they make you an offer you kind of offer and then you then you start having to actually write a book uh what yeah. was that process like and like what were your motivations inspirations and yeah what what kept you going um well ever since i was young one of my life goals has been to write a book and even as a kid i had even i was obsessed with books um books are like a really big thing in my life. And it was like, that is one thing I have to accomplish in my life. And up until um, the last couple of years, I was like, ah, what do I write about? I don't know what to write about. Um, where's my voice? Where's my very mm. specific, what hasn't been written before? And, and how, how do I get that across in my voice? You know? Right. How do you tell your story um, as opposed to yeah. someone else's story? Yeah. Or do I even have a story to tell, you know? And that was also, it's like, you know, where's, what's going to be interesting to people and what's going to, um, what am I going to feel passionate enough about to write? And so it's actually started out as a wild food cookbook. And um, I started with one uh, publisher that's done a lot of foraging books and they loved it. They thought it was fantastic. They loved my photography. Um, but they actually signed another well-known forager at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so mine got the cut and, but the editor was so just believed in what I was doing. He's like, okay, I can't let this just go, go talk to this agent and, you know, she'll, she'll help you out. So I ended up with an agent and then, um, we, we ended up at, Countryman Press, who have been amazing. I, I've heard so many horror stories about working with publishers and editors and, and everything. And um, it just, it was actually a really great experience. And people are, uh, the, the people were great to work with. They were very helpful. Um, and I loved the experience. It, uh, it really forced me to sit down and write and research mm -hmm. because otherwise it's like, eh, if I don't have a deadline, I can just go for a walk in the woods and, um, you know, spend my time doing other things and be like, yeah, I'm going to write a book someday. And then, you know, yeah. you know how that's easy to get distracted. Yeah. You're so, like, oh, there's stuff out there. I could go for a hike. Yeah. Sitting here in the laptop right. doesn't really sound as, as fascinating as being outside. But <laughs> Exactly. But yeah, structure yeah, so having that helps. deadline, mm -hmm. yeah. 
yeah, that was that was fun. Um, and hopefully things go well with the book and I'm and they sign me back on for another um, something to write about. It's like I was, I've been very interested in mushrooms and I wanted to know all about them. So I wrote a book and now I'm like, well, what else can I write about? What else can I <laughs> dive into, you know? I mean, there's a lot of topics. Like I said, as a Jill of all trades, I'm pretty sure you could speak extensively on a whole bunch of stuff that would make people really, really interested. But so you, I mean, you focused on mushrooms and cooking and probably a, a very, I mean, a forager's perspective, right? From what you were writing about. Um, yeah. Were you, and, and I know from having watched your Instagram that you didn't do just West Coast. You also flew to the East Coast last summer, drove or whatever, however, I know things are a little complicated with COVID, but you managed yeah. to do it as safely as possible. And you made yeah. it out there and you met some cool people along the way too. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about like what it was to forage in a completely different biome and, and you know, meet, meet people on a different <laughs> coast with mushrooms in common? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, I mean, it couldn't have happened any better. Um, when I signed the contract for the book, it, our, our season had just ended and things were drying up. And I was like, okay, um, I need photos of all these mushrooms and like everything. I'm like, that's all, that's the only option I have is to go to the other, to the East Coast. I'd never been there before. I'd never, um, you know, except for probably when I was 13, I visited some family in Virginia, but I certainly wasn't looking for mushrooms at that point. So with the power of the internet and Facebook and um, Instagram, I was able to connect with foragers out there who I had heard the East Coast isn't so friendly. I was like kind of prepared for people to be, no way, you, you know, California, no, you're not coming <laughs> over here and, and stealing my spots, no. Uh, but people were so welcoming, so helpful, and I could not have done it without them. So there's definitely some big thank yous in my book to all of those very generous foragers out there. And, and now, you know, and now they're my friends. So it's the power of, of the community is, is just amazing. And I think that's one of those really special things about the mycology community is it when you're first getting started, it feels like there's these people that are somehow on pedestals and, you know, maybe you and I being one of them because people look and say, oh, look at all the cool things they do. But like, I think we'd also be the first people to say like, we're just human beings. And, you know, I've met a lot of people in this mycology community by just being like sending a message being like, hey, what you do is cool. Can we chat or I have questions or like going up to someone at mushroom camp and just introducing yourself. And you'd be amazed by how easy it is to, to meet people because, again, we're all human beings and we like mushrooms. And if you have something interesting to talk about that's in common, you can find common ground really quickly. So. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm totally just a regular human being. And uh, it's funny how people uh, like get all weird about it. And I'm like, I'm just a big <laughs> dork, <laughs> really. If you, if you knew me, um, yeah, I'm the most awkward, dorkiest person in the world. <laughs> Yeah, it was, you know, if people could, could see you the way your daughter see you kind of thing, you're like, trust me, I'm not cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, they're like, uh, not another mushroom mom. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. But they're good. They're good kids. Yeah. And I mean, I know that's, that's a challenge too, being a mom and trying to do the travel. <laughs> but you recently got yourself a van made it a little easier for your kids to come along sometimes so they've gotten more excited about some of these foraging trips um uh, for the most bit. part I, I kind of have to sell it as like we're going on an adventure to go see you know maybe what national parks or something because we're we're going to go to montana this summer um and i'm like okay what mushrooms are happening in the summer in montana <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they're only going to be this age once. And so it's, I try to have a, a balance. It's not always easy, but um, they love the adventure part. And uh, although they, they do complain a lot, but uh, I think in the long, yeah, in the long run, these are the things they're going to remember and be like, whoa, uh, some everybody's mom wasn't like this. And <laughs> I guess we did some pretty cool things. 
I think I th you know it may be a, a little bit of a rough road now, but I think I think you'll see it because you know as yeah. ultimately as teenagers you push away everything that you once thought was interesting because it's all lame and it's all whatever, and then you know you hit your like mid twenties and you're like, wow, I have all these interests that were cultivated. I wonder where they came from. You're like, oh, my parents and that <laughs> stuff I used to think was so lame is suddenly so cool right. to me. So hopefully that'll happen. You know. <laughs> I think it you will. Also, I think it will. Yeah, I, I think so. You also have a adventure cat, if I'm not wrong, right? That occasionally comes out on the road with you. <laughs> yep, my uh, I have three cats, but the older one, she has some special needs. So she comes along with me and she just loves to hang out, sit on my lap and look out the windows we're going by and and if only I could hear her thoughts in her mind. Every time I open the sliding door, there's this new world that appears. And, and in, her, in her eyes, she's like, hmm, that was not the last place we were. Where are we now, Mom? So it's, yeah. it's fun. It's fun to have somebody to, even though she doesn't talk back, it's, it's nice to have somebody to share the experiences with and, and be like, hey, you know, check this out. What are you doing back there? Can you make me a sandwich? No. <laughs> Hasn't learned that trick yet. Well, I was going to say, my, my cat talks back a lot. She's very vocal, but I don't think she'd be much of a traveler. So <clears throat> she's good company at home, but not probably wouldn't be much, much use on the road, unfortunately. But, but I see your adventure cat, and I'm like, so one of these days, one of these days, I'll get a cat that will come with me. Mm -hmm. That'd be fun. Yeah. Well, she's 16, so, you know, she's she's okay just hanging out most just of the time. Hanging out. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. So as, as you're, I mean, you upgraded too, because you had this sort of badass, you know, outback that you went <laughs> everywhere in. And now you've got a little bit more swanky of a setup. It's still, you know, it's still a van, but you've got a little bit more, uh, you know, oh, flexible yeah. is... living space and stuff. So. Yeah, this is so luxury compared to what I was doing for the last five years. Um, I was doing everything out of my Subaru, the back of my Subaru. And, um, you know, it was tight, but, you know, I totally made it work. It was so, like, just perfect. Everything had its spot. I had it all dialed in by the end. Um, but, like, one of my favorite um, memories is actually... Um, I think it was, yeah, it was last year in Shasta. Uh, I had, we, you know, we, it was a great foraging trip, had basketfuls of porcini. And I mean, it they, was epic last year. You had, right? you were like, I'm not picking any more porcini because I don't even have room. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, so my, my cooler was full of them, but there was, there was just no more room. So I was literally laying, surrounded, sleeping with porcini like spread out around me I'm like trying to <laughs> sleep in my car in you know with yeah surrounded yeah, wake up in the night turn over and just be like uh it's pretty <laughs> it's like oh there's that one's got some worms <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's actually that's a good segue because I wanted to ask you about mushroom preservation because as mm -hmm. I mean you know you have the jars of herbs behind you but you make these trips and, you know, to help put this in context for people, you live in L.A. So driving up to Oregon, driving to Northern California, I mean, this is like 12, 13, 14 hour days in the car kind of thing. And you usually break it up in a couple of legs and stuff like that. But like it represents a massive investment of time, gas money, your personal capital, you know, you having to find people take care of your cats and things you have going on at home, make sure your daughters are, you know, it's, it's a lot for you just to leave. It's not like you can just drop everything and walk away. And I, you know, I believe I understand this, um, but not even, I'm not a, a parent, you know, for me, it is ostentatiously pretty easy to just walk away, but you're like, I have a lot of stuff to plan out. So you do all this planning, you go up there and ideally you strike it big. Cause if you get skunked, it sucks. You know, that is a big yeah. investment, but when you have all of this sort of mushroom capital and what it represents, what do you do with it? How do you how do you maximize it so that you're getting the the value out of it and making sure you can share that stuff with people later? Well, first of all, it has taken me a year, a few years to uh, figure, you know, get that all dialed in. I do have a story about um, one year going to uh, uh, Telluride uh, for the Telluride Festival, and and I had 
I had uh, foraged so much stuff. I bought some great porcini, uh, and it's a 14 hour drive. And I got back and they were just bags of mush. Just no, my cool, my, good. that was in, yeah, that was in my Subaru. My cooler was not, did not, it did not do well. And so, yeah, and I felt like it was a total waste of a trip. I mean, other than the experience, but um, I ended up with nothing. Like maybe I salvaged a slice, but um, yeah, preservation is really key. Um, yeah, to go through all of that and to, you know, for not to not have anything to show for it is is not good. Um, but I, with the van, has made my life so much better. Uh, I have it runs off of solar, so I have a dehydrator, which is super key to getting them dehydrated right on the spot. Um, right. You know, before I was trying to dehydrate stuff on my dashboard, which it does work. You know, uh, you're you're kind of creating a little um, solar oven dehydrator right there. Um, but you don't have the airflow. Now you have the heat, but not necessarily the airflow unless you like leave all your windows open. And there's different issues there, right. depending on where you're parked. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so having a dehydrator on hand is helpful. Um, you know, and if you didn't have solar, you could, you know, maybe find somewhere that you could plug in for a couple hours and just get that kind of most of that moisture out. Um, mm -hmm. And that's but, probably the biggest, biggest yeah. thing for like mushrooms is getting them dry because it's the water activity that allows the bacteria mm -hmm. and the molds and the, and the bugs. And as soon as you get a little bit of heat and a little bit of, you know, lack of moisture, even if it's not mm -hmm. fully dehydrated, it's not going to go moldy. It's not going to turn to goo, like you said. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the idea is to get all that water out. Um, but also um, with the help of the van, I can also pickle things right on the spot. I can ferment things. I have jars. I have all my ingredients with me. Uh, that's kind of the idea of, well, that is the idea of my van is it's basically a mobile um, wild food kitchen. You know, everything can happen right there. Everything's um, set up for it. And that way nothing goes to waste. I hate, I absolutely hate it when I've harvested something, especially if it's, you know, a native plant, something that's really special that, you know, you shouldn't be harvest over harvesting in the first place. Um, I only take, you know, a very small amount of anything that, you know, may be sensitive. Um, and it's the last thing I would want to do is for it to go bad before I could get to it and living, you know, 14, 20 hours away from, where I'm collecting from is, is a big challenge. So this has, this van has changed my life for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Cause there is, I've, I've felt that before when I picked things and brought them home and said, okay, this is, mm -hmm. you know, kind of special to remove something from its environment. You do feel yeah. some inherent sense of guilt, but you're like, if I'm going to take this much, like if you were, I mean, not that you do this because you're vegan, but if you if you're going to take the life of an animal, use right. the whole thing, right? Make sure that you're giving it respect. And the same thing with a plant. If you're going to pick a plant, try to use the whole thing. You know, make yeah. sure that you're not just taking one little piece of it and throwing the rest out. If the whole thing is edible, that you're maximizing it, you're respecting it, and you're you're, you're sort of giving its due respect to the the fact that you you took this thing out and you're and preservation is the way to do that, especially if you're far away from home. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so cool to see all the projects you do of, you know, not just drying, but yeah, like you mentioned, the, the pickling, the lactic preservation, um, there's so many different things you can do. And it's, that's what I love, like following you and seeing all the different ways you come up with how to like, preserve these things. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's so cool. It's really um, fun to watch you do it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, this is, um such a journey it's such a an honor to be able to work with these plants these mushrooms these this way of life um it's not something that people do anymore you know in you know everybody's going to amazon or um you know their grocery store to get all their food so this is um i feel like it's such an honor to have the ability to do this you know yeah. When, and you talk too about like how it connects you to the land, it connects you to the seasons. 
And so, and like you said, you become a little bit of what you eat. And so you have, you know, in your travels over the past year, you have become cross-continental. You know, you've become Jess of LA, Jess of Oregon, Jess of Washington, of New Hampshire and Connecticut, and, you know, all these places where you were delving into the soils and delving into the earth and, and assimilating that into who you are and who you're becoming, which is, again, just a really cool thing to see. And that harkens back to, you mentioned uh, when you had your first child that you, you kind of made a pretty major dietary shift. And so your philosophy changed and you decided to kind of re-envision yeah. the way that you look at food, your relationship with food. And I think a big part of that was you becoming vegan. Do you want to talk some about like what being vegan means to you and, you know, your reasons, motivations and how you make it sustainable for you? Yeah. Um, so for one, uh, I hate labels. I, I can't stand labels. You know, I don't even really call myself a vegan because that really puts people in a box. Um, I do. I prefer plant based. Um, and, you know, I was a very, very strict vegan for um, probably 13 years. And now something like that. Um, and a significant chunk of time, at least. Very, yes, it was. Yeah. And a part of that time, I was a raw vegan. And so as a raw vegan, you know, you don't eat anything cooked over 118 degrees. Everything is um, just pure ingredients that have not been preserved, have not been altered or processed in any way. Um, and that was a really great learning experience for me um, as far as working with food. Um, but as far as why I chose to stick, well, why it worked with me initially, if it hadn't worked so profoundly for me at the beginning, I wouldn't have stuck with it. But mm. um, I have a lot of, uh, I have some health conditions that don't do well with really inflammatory foods, which mm. dairy is one of those. And so by cutting out dairy, it, it, literally changed my life and how I felt. And I was like, for the first time in my life, I felt, whoa, I don't have to be in pain all the time. I don't have mm. to hurt. I don't have to deal with these chronic um, sinus issues. And um, it, yeah, it changed so much. And that just kept pushing me farther and farther down the rabbit hole, you know, and it, my health just improved and improved and and now looking back I do add in fish once in a while because there's a lot of nutrients that um, fish and seafood um, have in them but um, I am trying to keep my options open and just being more aware of what's putting I put in my body and what I am you know how I'm interacting with my food mm -hmm. rather than just buying something off the shelf because it has a really nice package and, or <laughs> it's cheap or it's, you know, whatever, uh, or I'm being marketed to, and uh, to buying a product. So it's, um, just really not just being vegan. It's more, I'm just being an aware and conscious, um, consumer, you know, and mm -hmm. realizing that, Oh, if something makes me feel bad, I'm not going to eat it. And that includes most animal products. I mean, for me, everybody is going to, you know, I certainly don't preach this. Um, I think that everybody has their own needs. Some people need a higher protein in their diet. They need more, um, you know, other things. But, you know, I do what works for me. And everybody's yeah. going to be on their own path. So... We <laughs> yeah it's i mean it's it's hard because it is such a loaded sort of issue for some people and it's really nice mm -hmm. to it's refreshing to hear that you know your perspective on it was just that like hey i wanted to do what worked for me and it was like a journey to kind of figure out like exactly where that balance was and you know i know we've talked to about mm -hmm. your time as a raw vegan kind of helped you inform like going back and being like okay I do like cooking my food somewhat and you have a little bit more uh, options with how you can eat and like what you can eat when you're able to actually cook your food. And, 
and quite honestly too is like looking at your food now i'm like it's clear that you've gone through the raw vegan phase but that you've like keyed into like here when i cook things i can make things extra delicious extra special because i'm putting in the work to process the food myself and that's the thing you're sort of talking about avoiding these yeah, there's a lot of like greenwashed vegan stuff that's really no better it's still just mm -hmm. processed food you can make a cheese it or exactly. whatever equivalent item vegan and, and sell it but it doesn't make it any better for you than the non-vegan version necessarily so what you're looking at is the way to interact with your food be present in the season and then like put the work of processing on yourself which can be laborsome but like at the same time the the payout you get from that is so much bigger because you're, you're thinking how you're eating and what the much more mindful i guess of of food mm -hmm. um which is an interesting way to go about you know living <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah um yeah and yeah that's why i go back to saying i don't like labels and you know because for for some time that i i felt that you know i can only eat this way these are the only things i can eat and you know, I realized I was missing out on a lot of experiences, too. So when I'm with mm -hmm. friends or um, going to, you know, a very fancy restaurant or something with a, you know, a chef that I want to experience their food, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I will make an exception. Um, yeah, I'll put myself I've dined in your hands. Probably, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've dined at some of the top restaurants in L.A. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I just, I want to have this experience and this is probably the only time i'm ever going to be here so let's do it you know <laughs> what so. can you tell me about like one of those one of those restaurant experiences where you kind of had your mind blown by like a, a really high-end chef because uh, i mean the food that i see you make i'm like man it blows my mind to see jess's food so like what blows your mind you know well you know um i was actually disappointed 90% of the time and I would see these great reviews and, and be like oh this is you really got to try this place this place is like you know Michelin starred it's great and I would try it and I'd be like hmm, okay well yeah I, I could do that like that's not <laughs> I mean it was it took a lot to be impressed and um, but then it, but it also gave me the sense of like, oh, I can do this. Like, I'm not that far off, you know, yep. I, I still have a lot to learn and a lot to, to, um, experiment with and understand, but, um, it felt achievable and, you know, we look with that at the time. So if your food looks, looks good, um, you're already a good portion of the way there. <laughs> Well, that's, that's a great point because certainly like looking at your food photos, uh, you take some of the best stuff that would, you know, be on par with anything that I've seen in Michelin star restaurants. And that's simply from the visual appeal of it because you've done such an incredible job of, you know, mixing colors and textures and sort of wild elements with, you know, processed elements. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I remember sticking out to me when I was looking at your food early on was you'd done like a lacto fermented lobster mushroom or something and you had some, you know I don't know some other nettle pesto and things like that but I was just like wow like every component of this dish is this sort of like interesting wild reinterpretation well you know you're applying technique and mixing it with foraging and then on top of everything you're just putting it together in this incredible aesthetic way and documenting it which is like another way of preservation too that I like to think about is that we have preservation for food but by documenting our food, we're then preserving the memory of it, the experience of it, and being able to share that with people that wouldn't ever get to taste it, but they can look at it and be like, wow, what is that? And how do I experience that? So, Right. Um, I mean, I have to credit my, my education in art and graphic design. I, before I did all of this is um, I was an art director and, um, well, you know, and, and, and did went through that path, but realized that sitting at a computer all day just was not going to cut it. And I was like, this, I'm making advertisements for all these companies and this stuff's just going to go in the trash. And mm -hmm. 
I want to do something good with what I can do. And that was not it. So it's really cool that I can bring together, you know, all of, all of my very, it seems like everything, I'm a little scattered, you know, at, at first when I, I had graduated from my um, art school and then I was like applying for an, a master's of science degree in herbal <laughs> medicine. I was like, okay, well, you know, sorry, mom and dad, I, I'm, you know, just jumping <laughs> around here. But really it, it all works together and um, it was really the perfect path. So um, yeah, but but to be able to put together a dish aesthetically and then photograph it, um, I feel like, you know, that's part of my mission is to get people interested in wild foods and get um, excited about them. Because if you have a plate of, um, you know, what looks like lawn clippings, uh, <laughs> you're not going to convince people that you should be eating healthier and eat your weeds. Uh, <laughs> so if you can make it look good, then, you know, you have a much better chance of changing someone's mind about uh, plants and, and the environment and, and making a positive impact. That's, yeah, I love that philosophy and just approach because you're like, you know, it's being very conscious of the diner of the consumer and their experience and how they approach it because yeah you you walk in you experience it visually first with your with your eyes and then as you get closer to the dish you know your your sort of organoleptic stuff takes over mm -hmm. but if you're not if it doesn't look good in the first place and especially if it comes to eating these sort of plant-based foods where someone might be a little skeptical or mm -hmm. or have some reservations about it you know it's inherently human beings are really keyed into like, Oh, look at that piece of meat. And so it's like, it's can be challenging to put out food where someone's like, where's the meat. And you're like, well, I'm not doing meat and I'm not trying to replace the meat by putting like a big piece of tofu on the plate. I am trying to serve plants and mushrooms and interesting components and ingredients that will present a really nuanced and complex like version of what I found in the, in the wilderness. And like one of the things I love watching you do is you teach these all day classes where you take people out for long hikes and it's hot and it's sweaty and there, everyone is like, you know, you're sitting there teaching people about like, as the naturalist you are, where you walk along, you're just like everything you pick up has a, a meaning and a purpose or a, a, a putting it in context of the ecology for people. Mm -hmm. And so I think people come back with this incredible uh, understanding that they didn't have before but then you managed to like bang out a meal, this multi-course <laughs> meal that's incredible looking. And I think, you know, that's where people really like buy into what you're saying because they're like, okay, I learned all this stuff, but here it is in practice. And, mm -hmm. you know, how, what goes through your head when you get back from like a day of teaching and you're like, okay, I'm going to put together like, you know, four, or not, I don't know how many courses for how many people, but like, it's, it could be pretty extensive sometimes. How do you plan those meals and like what goes into your course progression, I guess? Um, it usually takes about six weeks to plan to really put together one of those dinners. Um, cause I'll do, I'll do, um, kind of some lighter tastings with some of my go for a walk. Uh, we'll talk about things and then, um, come back and have some tastings of, of some dishes that I've prepared. Um, but it's, it takes quite a bit of preparation, uh, to, to put one of these things on. Uh, like I have a, a wild food dinner happening in Washington next month and I'm already, you know, putting together ideas. I'm, you know, things have to be forged in advance. Uh, they have to be pr um, processed and, and um, yeah, and planned out. It's, it's a lot of work, um, but I really enjoy the creative challenge of it and this is going to be my first one that is out of my, you know, home region. So I'm excited to be playing with some new plants that, mm. uh, that I haven't worked extensively with before, but um, it, should be, it should be a lot of fun, but it's, yeah, there, there's so much that goes into it. Um, and, and you really get to see what kind of forage really are because, <laughs> um, a good forager has, um, you know, works throughout the whole year. And whether it's, you know, if I need acorn flour for a dish, there's enough acorns 
back in November and process them and had them on hand to use them in June. You know, right. um, you know, we can't really it just in the moment right here, right now, this is what we can do. I mean, it's possible, but to really get a full meal and go all out, um, it's cool to bring in those ingredients that, that you've collected throughout the year. Um, and yeah, it's just so much fun and people really get so much out of it. They, I have people who, they remember the specific things that I've made where I'm like, I don't remember. I, you yeah, know, yeah. I've done so been, many. Yeah, I've done so many of these and, but people will come to me and they're like, that one dish you made, that was just, it blew my mind. It was so amazing. And um, that, that's just really cool. You know, they're in the environment, they're sitting out in nature and they're eating this food that came right from that landscape, you know, and, and things maybe they've seen on a, a walk earlier in the day um, that I've put on or, you know, so they were introduced and then now they're tasting it. And, and it's that multi-sensorial experience where you're just, you've got the sounds, the tastes, the aromas, the, and then it's part of you, you know? So. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's what makes your experience so special. Cause it's linking people, like you said, to that, that time and space and you're challenging uh, and shifting people's perspectives on what is food, right? Because as a hiker, you might just walk around and say, this is just all useless plant material. And, you know, I'm not connecting to anything in this environment because it's just wilderness. Mm -hmm. And you show them that wilderness right. is, in fact, a grocery store full of delicious things. They might take a little bit more work or a little bit more knowledge to get it to the point of being food. But that leaves sort of an indelible mark on people's mental makeup because you realize that the world is full of food and what we've artificially selected as crops and turned into vegetables and stuff is really just domesticated versions of the things that are out there. And how many more things could Absolutely. we domesticate or at least understand and look at and like pull from our environment again in a respectful and, you know, meaningful way that doesn't harm things, but like how much more could we respect the biodiversity that exists in nature if we realize that it's all has value and all could potentially be food uh, rather than just sort of saying, nah, it's, it's, it's wilderness, you know, plow it, plant right. fields. You're like, no, that's exactly. Yeah. The more people value. understand. Yeah. The more people realize that there's real food out there, that there is value. They are, you know, it's scientifically proven that they will care more. They will have a more invested interest in what happens to that land. And that's, that really there is the core, you know, of what I do is, is to get people to realize that there is value in nature and, um, you know, right outside our doorstep. <laughs> I love that. That is, I mean, because I feel like in many ways, that's kind of what I try to accomplish too. You know, we have slightly different ways of going about it, but it's like just trying to help people key into that amazing biodiversity that exists and showing them that it's worth protecting by exposing mm -hmm. them to something that they might not see otherwise and and yeah helping to connect them through food because that's I, I know for certainly for me like mushrooms wouldn't have been as interesting if I couldn't eat them if they right. were just you know amalgamation of stuff I, meh, whatever but like being able to find things that you can eat and then like getting yeah. to find new things like last year being up in Shasta I mean like Jess I can't you were just like popping butter beliefs <laughs> left and right and I was like what are you looking for and eventually you were like okay there's one right there and I was like what I don't see anything You're like get down to your hands and knees and uncover that little sh piece of dirt and I was like I don't believe you and like boom there it was my first butter belief. and I was like I got that moment on on film and like that video has done fantastic because I think people just like key into my excitement they keyed in your excitement because I was just like you know Jess here it is and you're like yeah you, got, you know it's <laughs> Um, right. I was like, oh, Gordon, don't step on them. And you're like, where? What? <laughs> where are they? <laughs> uh, that was great. But yeah, yeah, it's until you have that experience and you get that that visual, it's invisible, you know, to us. Um, exactly, and yeah. that's yeah. So but I wanted to say one more thing of how, um, you know, caring about the environment and and all that and, and eating from it is, um, you know, eating from the environment that, um, you know, that's our most intimate connection to mm. the land. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's where um, experiences really become connected. And so to 
to have that experience of finding those beliefs and then going back and eating them for dinner, you know, yeah. that is just such a memorable thing. And it's, it's just so interconnected with us. And we are, you know, it's part of us. We are part of the environment. Right. You realize that instead of being the separate entity, you are really just part of the continuum of nature. And we as human beings continually seem to wreck our environment because we don't realize that we are one with nature and thus we are wrecking ourselves. We are wrecking the planet around us that we live on. And it's kind of hard to reconcile those things with being like a human being and also being like, wow, my species is just like running roughshod over everything that exists. And people generally don't seem to care or they do care, but it's in this very sort of mm -hmm. superficial, like, oh, I'll carry like a, reusable water bottle kind of way rather than like, Hey, how do we stop corporations from wrecking the earth? You know? Um, I don't know. It's, right. It's, it's like, if you, <laughs> yeah, it's like, if you knew that somebody, you know, Walmart was coming in and going to plow over your, your, your prized morel patch, you would probably care a little bit more than if you were like, Oh, it's just, that's that empty lot over there. And cool. I can go buy my, um, you know, my six pack of Cheap Diet Coke, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my under, yeah, crappy meat and stuff. Anyhow, right. um, so what I wanted to ask you, uh, now that you are, things are getting a little bit less weird with COVID, you're going back to doing some dinners, going back to doing some classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you got coming up? So, and also when's your book coming out and what's the title? Like I want to know, people are going to know what does Jess Star would do. So tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so my book is coming out on August 17th, which is the week of Telluride Mushroom Festival. So that's, I go there every year, and that's kind of like a big deal for me. So I'm like, maybe have a little tie in with that. Um, but yeah, that's called Mushroom Wanderland with the A, wander, because we're wandering the forest looking for this wonderland of mushrooms. Uh, kind of a it's, has a little bit of a whimsical touch to it, uh, which is partly my style. And, but it's also very informative uh, beginner's book to uh, finding kind of the top 25 mushrooms that to look for, you know, I, it was so hard to uh, narrow it down to that many. I'm like, oh, but what imagine. about this one? And what about that one? <laughs> They're all so magical and wonderful, but um, you know, it's, it's a great guide for people to just get started. Um, it gives them something to look for and also talks about nutritional information, um, a little bit of medicinal information as well. So if you're inter interested in medicinal mushrooms, kind of the herbal aspect of them, um, I included that as well. And, you know, uh, toxic species. Um, and then of course, culinary and how to preserve mushrooms, how to, um, how to a basic, you know, methods on cooking them, something that you could, um, you know, anybody could pick up and, and do. Not going into kind of the, the more extensive things that you might see on my Instagram, but um, something that's approachable. Um, but anyway, so that's called Mushroom Wonderland, um, August 17th. And um, as far as classes, I'm doing, I'm still doing private classes right now. Um, so as far as, um, you know, people ask me, hey, you know, when I want to go learn about wild food area. Um, so I'm doing, you know, just small private classes, but I'm also doing um, two uh, multi-month or kind of series of classes, uh, which I just finished or I'm just now finishing the first one, which is a wild food program that has run from February through Mar um, February through May. And that's been all focused on wild food. And it's partly on Zoom. And partly we do field trips, we go to the mountains, we go to the desert, um, we go to the chaparral, we, you know, get to experience all of those things. So it's a really immersive program. Um, but there's also one coming up in the fall, which is focusing all on herbal medicine. And that one I'm really excited about, you know, I have my um, background in herbal medicine and making medicine and all of that. So I'm excited to share that stuff again, um, not just medicinal plants, but also medicinal mushrooms as well. Of course, I'm 
can't leave those out. So <laughs> we will also be doing field trips and workshops and um, and then also some lecture on Zoom, but that's gonna be from September through uh, November. Cool. And people, for those, anyone who's interested, yeah. they can find those classes on your website, juststarwood.com, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So she's, yep. she's easy to find. Com. Yeah. Oh, yeah. J star. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Just, just Google it. She's on Instagram. You ha I convinced you at one point to join TikTok, although I don't think I've ever seen you post anything, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, TikTok is not, not for me. I already spend enough time on Instagram and Facebook that I don't that's, need that's another fair. one. So. Yeah, no, no I, I don't recommend it. It's a huge time sink, <laughs> but it is interesting. And there's some cool people on there. So I've appreciated I'm it. I'm sure. So. I'm sure. <laughs> And if nothing else, you were very popular on TikTok because for that flash of that <laughs> video where I showed you, everyone's like, oh my God, I love Jess. And I was like, well, go follow her on Instagram. She's, you know, uh, she's not coming to TikTok, but. Yeah, um, no, I got to draw been... the line somewhere. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's important. I think social media, you need to have those boundaries, uh, you know, much like you're learning with your kids too. It's important to have parts of your life that are a little siloed and personal and not everything needs to be on social media. But what I am very grateful is on social media is your incredible cooking, the wealth of knowledge you share with us and just, you know, the, I guess the aesthetic that you bring to certain things. Cause it is, it's absolutely gorgeous. And if you haven't seen Jess's photography, food photography, especially go check it out. Cause it's just mind blowing. Um, I am excited to hopefully get to eat with you again sometime soon. And as always, you know, if you're going up and down the state, feel free to hit me up. You've always got a place or, you know, driveway and Napa that you're welcome to come to. Uh, Perfect. But yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. And I'm really excited to read your book and maybe I'll look at buying a ticket for Telluride. That'd be kind of, if you're there, it'd be <laughs> nice to like know that I have a friend who's there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because I'm sort of intimidated to go alone, but. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I go every year. It's one of my favorite uh, events of the year. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Keep it in mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jess, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Um, wonderful thank to you. see you and uh, wishing you the best of luck. Maybe I'll catch you in the mountains somewhere sometime soon. Sounds good. So. See you <laughs> okay. in the forest. <laughs> Bye. Bye.